class. Um, I guess I'll do the introductions. My uh, name is Cranston. My office is in Roland Hall. Five forty B. I'll have office hours at these times. Now, is there anybody who cannot make either of those times? One person? Two? OK. Um, let's try also then um, Wednesday uh, 2 to 2.50. Still can't make it? It's OK. I, I work full time. Oh, you work full time. And would you be able to make those? OK. Right. Maybe you can try by you know, an appointment. OK. okay. Um, there's a lot of information on the, well, there will be things posted on the web page. So the uh, assignments will be due Fridays, except the last week. Uh, it'll be due Wednesday, because the final exam will be on the last Friday of class. For grading, your grade will be determined by the following. 10% will rely on the result of homework, which is every week. 10% will be reliant on quizzes. That leaves 80%. Thirty-five percent will be based on the midterm, and forty-five percent on the final exam. Term will be Friday, July 12th, and it'll be in the discussion section. And the final will be in this, and it'll be in this room, by the way.
and you can't see that in the back, can you? Is that better? Okay. <clears throat> um, the syllabus is on the web page. Yeah. I believe uh, July 31st is a Wednesday. I'm checking myself right now, though. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. I think the exam is the 31st, though. Is that? Yes. Yeah? That's okay. Tuesday, okay. So, right. Sorry. Thanks very much. I had the 31st right. OK. Um, and also, so the, the um, material we'll cover is um, outlined on the uh, web page. There's a syllabus there. It tells what we're going to cover week one, week two, week three, four, and five. So essentially, uh, each week we go through the equivalent of two weeks of material from the standard fall, winter, or spring quarter. So the pace of the course will be sort of quick. Maybe you like that. Um, that would mean that it would be easy to fall behind if you um, don't keep up every day with uh, the material. So um, <clears throat> I encourage you to uh, study hard. Um, do all the assignments, homework uh, that is assigned, and even do uh, homework that's not assigned. And, um, the more uh, attention you pay to doing homework problems, uh, the better your score will be. In the out and <clears throat> so um, if you uh, manage to do a lot of the homework problems or, uh, from the chapters, I think you'll do quite well. Um, let's see. And then from time to time, I'll put up other things on the uh, uh, web page, uh, maybe some biographical remarks about some of the interesting uh, statisticians and what they've done. Uh, one of the uh, statisticians, uh, maybe this will be next quarter, uh, that we'll study, uh, uh, whose work we'll study, worked for um, Guinness Brewery. And um, maybe you didn't know, Guinness is actually a big uh, agribusiness. And, uh, he published, uh, somebody from Guinness published some material that was considered confidential, uh, and the company didn't like it. So after that, they forbid their uh, researchers from publishing. And this guy had some interesting material that uh, he thought should be published, so he published under an assumed name, and the name he used was student. And now there are thing, there's something called the student T statistic. And I think we might even get to that this quarter. Um, I think uh, that's about it for the introduction. Any question on anything procedural? Yeah. Uh, in the uh, recitations on uh, Wednesdays. So um, starting this week. And I'll adopt the usual civilized policy of dropping the lowest score on the quiz, quizzes and the lowest score on the homework. Yeah? What are recitations? What are they? Yeah. Oh, that's, oh, that's the discussion section, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Other questions? All right, so the class goes for two hours. Um, typically, I'll call for a break around uh, 10 minutes to 10, and we'll resume at uh, 10, and then I'll try to finish by 10.45, though sometimes it's hard for me to stop talking once I start. But I'll try to be reasonable. Um, 
Also, uh, for the rules, um, please don't leave uh, during the class unless you have you know, some uh, pressing appointment uh, that you have to get to. Uh, no texting during class. I, I will call you out for texting if I see it. Also, no surfing the internet. No computers out. Uh, I'd like to have your full attention during the class. Okay, so any more procedural questions? Yes? Where's the class webpage? Oh, okay. Um, let's see, you can go to, uh, I, I don't have the address off the top of my head, but here's how you can find it. Go to the math department webpage. So that's uh, math.uci.edu. And then um, at the top there's a bar, and uh, one of the things there is undergraduate. Click on undergraduate. And then over on the left, I think it says courses. Click on courses. And uh, I think that should take you to something that sa says course homepages. Okay. Click on course homepages, and there'll be a list of all the classes that are being offered this summer. And then you can go, you can find it from there. Thank you. Okay. And the uh, first homework assignment will be up uh, later today. Okay, so the topic of this course is probability and statistics. Um, probability is a very useful field. Comes into modeling all sorts of uh, phenomena in nature, in science, and um, we're going to study or start to study the uh, mathematical. Um, uh, aspects of that subject, and Probability starts with something called the sample space that describes all the possible outcomes in an experiment. So the most basic experiment uh, probabilists have in mind is um, coin tossing. If you toss a coin once, there are two possible outcomes. Either it's a head or a tail that shows up. And so here is the sample space. Maybe I'll call it S. No, I'm sorry. I'll call it omega. It will consist of two possibilities, heads or tails. And we denote that by H or T. That would be what the uh, sample space would be if you toss a coin once. What if you toss a coin twice? possible outcomes be now. You could have heads both times, 
You could have heads followed by tails, or tails followed by heads, or both tails. And we can keep going like this multiple times. All heads, and then all heads followed by finally a tail. Oops. Maybe the penultimate toss was a tail, but all the others were heads. And then finally, at the end of this list, we'd have all tails. So the sample space can be quite large, depending on what the experiment is. Now this uh, experiment could also, uh, there are many experiments that have two outcomes. So sometimes we might say omega is a set with two elements, S and F. Typically S stands for success and F stands for failure. So this might be when you're testing uh, medicine. You give the medicine to a, a subject, patient or something. And uh, the outcome will be S if the patient recovers from whatever ails her. And it would be failure if the medicine didn't work. Or you might send an email. It would be a success if it reaches its uh, the intended recipient. It would be failure if it doesn't. Okay. So th this is a very common sample space. and you could have repeated trials, and this would be S, 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 F, F, S, F, F, or you might have multiple trials, especially in uh, testing medicines. You, you wouldn't want <coughs> put much, um, <coughs> you wouldn't uh, put much um, weight on an experiment where you tested the medicine on only one subject, but you might think the medicine is pretty effective if you test it on 1,000 people and it worked 990 times. But if it works just once, well, that, who knows whether, what that means. It, uh, you need larger samples. So typically, you come to sample spaces like this. Another example, if you um, roll a die, some of you might have been to Las Vegas and actually done this. What would the sample space be here? Or you might roll two. And you'd want to keep track of multiple outcomes. Like that. So this would be a sample space with 36 elements. Or you might roll a whole handful of die, like five of them. And then you'd have a larger sample space where you keep track of the outcome on each roll. So this means that on the first roll you got a one, and the second roll you got a one. First roll you got a one, second roll two. Things like that. Okay.
smoke detectors work by emitting alpha particles. And there's a little capacitor. And when there's smoke, uh, the smoke gets ionized and the spark can jump across the capacitor making a circuit. You might count the number of alpha particles that is emitted, say, from your smoke detector in an hour. That's some number. What would the sample space be here if your experiment is to count the number of alpha particles? Well, how many alpha particles might have been emitted? Possibly none. Maybe one, maybe two, maybe three. Should we stop anywhere? If I stop somewhere, well, maybe it emitted more. So I think we should have the whole uh, nat set of natural numbers there. Now this could also uh, be used to model, say, the number of customers that come into 7-Eleven between 12 and 1 in uh, Taipei on a Saturday morning. Okay? There could be any number of customers that come in. Or the number of uh, email messages you receive in a week. This would be something like that. The number of times lightning strikes in a field uh, that's uh, five acres big in the middle of Kansas, or the number of tornadoes in a month in Nebraska, Any, anything that's counting things like this. How many buses come by in an hour, stuff like that. Sometimes you might have to wait for a, a bus. How long might you have to wait for a bus? Well, I don't think a negative number would be appropriate here. Like you have to wait minus one hour. What would that mean? It wouldn't have much meaning. So here, the sample space should be something like that. And probably some of you think I should include infinity in there, if you've ever waited for a long time for a bus. <laughs> but uh, you didn't wait for an infinite amount of time, because you're here now. <laughs> so waiting for a bus. Also, uh, how many of you drive? Probably a lot of you. Uh, have you ever been uh, sort of like the seventh or eighth car back at a red light? Yeah. It seems like you have to wait an infinite amount of time then, right? But what, you have to wait for what? Well, the first car has to go. The person in the first car is on the phone, doesn't see the screen. <laughs> car in the second, the second car has to go, and that person's texting. In the third car, the driver's turning around because his little son is crying in the back. OK, so you have to add up a bunch of waiting times for that, right? I'm sure you're all aware of that. So that's another waiting time. We'll study the statistical properties of these later, but again, it would be something like this. Or even in this experiment here, you might uh, count the time until the next alpha particle is emitted. And then that would be the sample space. So uh, there are many other. Uh, things. Uh, one of the common, popular one nowadays is poker hands. So a sample space here would look like what? Well, um, poker hand has five cards in it, I believe. And uh, you might have something like uh, the ace of spades, the king of spades, the queen of spades, the jack of spades, and then the two of diamonds. 
<laughs> you thought you were getting a straight flush, didn't you? And et cetera. Okay, so this is a pretty common, uh, I mean, pretty sensible, probably, or probably sample space for such a thing. And it goes on and on. Okay, so there are many possibilities here. <coughs> Okay, so um, you can do various things with these sample spaces. Um, there are sets. Subsets of sample spaces are called events. Now you have to be a little bit careful. There are some technical conditions that we have to apply here when the sample space is something like a half line or maybe the whole real line. But uh, I won't get into those uh, technical details. For the other sample spaces that are discrete like this, there, there's no technical problem about what kind of things can be events. Any subset in the discrete sample space that is something that can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with this will be called an event. So some examples. See from from one maybe uh, let's say A is that uh, the event that you had three heads when tossing a coin up six times. Okay, that would describe an event. It would be a subset of the sample space where you had a string of H's and T's of length 6. And this one would have the following elements. Maybe I'll write down the last one. Like that. OK. So just a quick question. How many elements does that event have? How many outcomes are in there? Hmm? Two to the sixth? Okay. I think you're telling me how many outcomes are in the whole sample space. We'll do this. We're going to start doing counting in a moment. But uh, can you? So the set of all possible outcomes would be of size two to the six. What about having half heads? Half, pardon? Six. Six. You think there are six here? No. Back there. 60? Okay, how do you get 60? Um, I remember what it's called, the 6 choose 3. It's so you have 6 possible options. Yeah. Here we have 6 slots. We'll do this. We're gonna, I'm going to go through this starting today. We have to start counting how many things there are in a set like this. So there are 6 slots where we're going to put in an H or a T. These represent the outcomes on the First, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth toss. Okay. 
the way you do this is you pick three places to put the H's, and then the remaining you have to put in T's. So all you do is count how many ways you can pick three slots to put an H in. Okay? The rest is automatic. You have no choice after that. You have to put T in the remaining ones. So <laughs> what he says in the back there is there's something called six choose three. It's the number of ways to choose a three element subset of a six element set. So here's our six element set, six slots. And we have to pick, select three from there. And in those three, we'll put in H's. So maybe it would be some like H, H, H is one possible choice. And then the remaining ones have to get T's, no choices. Okay. Well, um, if you're, well, I'm going to build up to this a little more, but the answer here can be written 6 choose 3, and it's 6 factorial over 3 factorial, 3 factorial. Okay, that's how many choices, how many uh, event, uh, outcomes are in that event. Okay, so don't worry if you don't understand this right now. We're going to do this today. In poker hands, um, Maybe uh, A equal to a straight flush would be a, an event. Straight flush means you get consecutive cards all in the same suit. OK, so remember the rule of against texting. You get, all, you get uh, all the cards that are in the same suit. That means they're all hearts or spades or all diamonds or all clubs. And then they're in consecutive order. So it might be something like two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five, six of hearts. That would be a straight flush. So this has a rather big, this is, seems like it's rather big, right? You could have the ace of spades, king of spades, queen of spades, jack of spades, ten of spades. And then maybe the king of spades, queen of spades, jack of spades, ten of spades, nine, etc. And I guess maybe the very lowest one would be something like the, um, uh, I guess the ace can be a, uh, the low card in poker, can it? Yeah. So one, two, three, four. This would be the lowest straight flush, flush. Every other straight flush would be this one. So how many ev outcomes do you think are in this event? 20. 20? How could you count them? Five? OK. How would you go about counting them? There are four suits, right? So all we'd have to do is count how many there are in a particular suit. OK. And then we would do what? Multiply that number by 4. So how many straight flushes are there if we focus on spades? 13? Well, how could you count that? How about counting the lowest card? How many, how many, possible, how, how many possibilities are there for a lowest card in your straight flush? Well, we'd have 10 is one possibility. 9 is another one. Eight, all the way down to ace, right? So how many is that? Eleven? Ten. ten. Yeah. How many numbers are there from one to ten? Ten. Okay. So there are ten in any particular suit, and there are four suits. That means there would be forty. Okay. So what about a um, full house? What would uh, this event be? This means three of one numerical value, two of another. So it would be something like three aces and then two kings. I'll write it this way. And then maybe three. <laughs> two aces. 
three kings. Now, if you're playing poker, um, which would you rather have, a full house or a straight flush? Why is that? Because it wins, right? <laughs> but why does it win? Yeah, it's that this event has fewer elements than this one, so this is less likely to happen. Why would this be less likely to happen? What would the, what would the likelihood depend on? How many elements are in the event in this, in this case? Because which hand is more likely, this one or this one? They're the same. What about this one or this one? They're the same. So when it comes to poker, any five-card hand has the same probability as any other five-card hand. So if you have an event, if you have two events, like straight flush and full house, which one wins? Well, whichever one has fewer elements. Straight flush wins over a full house because there are fewer straight flushes than full houses. We'll count this uh, later today. Okay, um, in waiting times, um, an event might be something like your wait was less than one hour. Okay. That would be the interval from zero to one. And finally, um, A might be the event K successes were observed. You perform some experiment n times, and you see that K times you had a success, the other times you had failure. Okay. K could be any number here from zero up to n. You might have no successes, or every trial might have resulted in success. For example, the experiment might be tossing a coin. And then K would be the number of heads that came up. And you might consider that to be a success if you're playing a game where you win a dollar from an opponent every time a head comes up, and you lose a dollar to that opponent every time a tail comes up. So what's the probability that a head comes up when you're tossing a coin? Yeah, a half, most of the time. Though it depends on who's tossing the coin. I know someone who can toss a coin, have it come up heads every time. And that's just an ordinary coin. He was uh, a magician, and he became a mathematician, works in probability. Now he's in the National Academy of Sciences, and he has many skills. One of them is being able to toss a coin, have it come up heads every time. He can also do this. He can take a deck of cards uh, that's just been purchased, open it, you know, take the plastic wrap off, shuffle it four times, and he shows you it's in its natural order. It's in the same order it came from in the deck. So be careful what you get into. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now um, maybe we should do a little bit of, remind you, I should remind you a little bit about um, com combining uh, sets 
since we're talking about events, um, we'll do things like uh, take unions, intersections, complements. So let me just remind you briefly about those things. <coughs> of two events would be the set of things in the sample space that are either in A or in B. Don't have to be in both. Pictorially, it looks like this. And then the union would be this entire region enclosed in these two things. So this, everything inside here is the Set A, everything inside there is a set B. A union B is that thing there. Intersection is what we get if we change the word or to and. Here, x has to be in both sets to be in the intersection. So if I draw the picture again, with this being A and this being B, then the intersection is just where they overlap. A minus B would be the set of things in the sample space that X is in A and X is not in B. Here the picture looks like this. Here's A. Here's B. What is it? What, what things are in A but not in B? the red shaded region. And we could also do B minus A. That would be everything over here. Okay. So this looks like uh, the moon during an eclipse. This is a shadow of the Earth. And uh, another one. Or a couple more, I guess. A complement is a set of things that aren't in A. So I'll picture the sample space as being a box, and then A is. This thing here, and then not A, or A complement. Well, that'd be everything that's not enclosed in A there, so it'd be all the green stuff here. define this set to be A minus B union B minus A. A symmetric difference of A and B.
So if I draw A and B as I've been doing before, what would this look like? Well, what does this part look like? That's the red region here, right? What would the other set look like here? What's this one going to look like? B minus A. Well, if I shade it in this part over here. Now, if I take the union of those two, what would, I, what would you have? Everything. Yeah, everything but this. Okay. So this would be. That. Okay. And uh, we'll use this symbol for the empty set. Which has, of course, no elements. Okay. Now, in probability, what we do is assign values to events. We call this value a probability. It's a number between 0 and 1. So mutually disjoint means they have no overlap. AI intersect AJ, which we defined, is empty. Then if you have non-overlapping sets, the probability of the union is the sum of the probabilities. Okay, so that's what a probability is. And I should also say one more condition, and the probability of the whole sample space is 1. Yeah. 
Here? Or like under the piece, is that supposed to denote something? Oh, I'm just, uh, that's calligraphy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> to, just to make it look like a serious capital letter. P. I could even, some people even make it look more. Yeah. That's crazy? OK, I won't do that. <laughs> make it really look like it's important. If I didn't do that, it would have tipped over, I guess. <laughs> I had to have a base. OK, so. Um, <clears throat> Is the empty set an event? Yeah. Be right. Just by definition, right? Any subset of a sample space is an event. So some number has to be assigned to the empty set. What number would that be? Why? That's correct. Well, I guess this is the probability that nothing happened, but uh, maybe that doesn't convince you that it, probably that is zero because there must have been some evenings in your life and nothing happened. <laughs> well, let's do this. Let's, uh, imagine our sample space looks like that. and. Let's take an event A. A will be this stuff here. What would A complement look like in that case? It's the other side, right? What's the union of A and A complement? It's everything, right? If I put those two together, I get all of omega. What's the intersection of these two? For you can't have something that's both in A and not in A simultaneously. So if I take A1 to be A and A2 to be A complement and apply this, what does it say? Since they are disjoint, we get this. Right? That's what this is saying, but with n equal to 2. And what's this number here? What's the number assigned to A union A complement by P? 1, because this is all of omega, right? So the probability of A complement is 1 minus probability of A. OK, this is really completely trivial. Yet, it's very useful. Because throughout the course, you'll be asked to compute probabilities. What's the probability of this? What's the probability of that? Sometimes it's easy to compute the probability, sometimes not. It might not be easy to compute the probability if uh, you're asked to compute the probability of something that's large, like a large event that involves a lot of counting. If the event is small, then computing this probability might be easy. So if A is big, what can you say about A complement generally? Should be small, right? So this is a way of computing probability of A if probability of A complement is really simple to compute. This side might be simple to compute, but this might be hard to compute directly. But indirectly, you can do this. Okay, so even though this is a trivial little thing, it can be very useful. Okay, it can convert a difficult computation in, 
to uh, an easy one. Okay. Okay, so let's take a 10-minute uh, break here. And come back at about in 10 minutes exactly. Okay, let's uh, resume. We'll do a few more things on probabilities here, and then go to. Uh, Some counting. <laughs> Suppose you have two events. Here's A, this is B, and here's Omega. What can we say about uh, these probabilities? Yeah, you want to say this is true, right? How do you prove that? Any reasonable assignment of probability should have this property. But does it follow from uh, the definition? That's what mathematicians are really pain sometimes. <laughs> prove even the most obvious things? The reason is because sometimes the obvious things aren't right. They're, tr they're false. Okay, so you have, we really like to be careful. Um, what properties do we have of probabilities? Well, we have this one and this one. Which one do you think would be useful in trying to prove that? This one? Well, maybe not. Maybe this one. This one says something about when you have a union of disjoint events. So somehow we want to get unions of disjoint events in here and use this. But there are other properties, like maybe this one, that might be useful too. So what would the disjoint events be? Well, maybe, how about this? A and B minus A. Let me draw a picture of, well, we have A here already. That's, that's that stuff. What's B minus A? That part, right? And are these disjoint? Mm -hmm. Because anything in here can't be an A. Anything in there has to be an A. So an element can't simultaneously be in both these sets. And what about the union of those two? I throw those two together, what do we get? B. Now we have a union of disjoint events. We can apply this to two events. Which two? This one and this one. Applying that property over there, this is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus A. And since these two are equal, over here we get the probability of B. So ignore the middle part here. What do we get? This probability plus this probability is this one. Now how can we prove this inequality up here? Yeah, this is bigger or equal to zero, right? This can't be negative. So that number has to be smaller than this one. Oops. Why can't we just assume that 
Well, uh, then what? Yeah, you, all you would know is what probability B is equal to then. Yeah. But why couldn't probability A be larger? Well, we can't have any greater than one. Oh, okay. Could be, it has to be less than or equal to one. Okay, so, um, but uh, we don't know this probability is one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But you might, uh, your idea would work if. You divide everything by probability b. And then, uh, and then consider only subsets of b. And that's, uh, you could do it that way. That would work. I think this is pretty direct, though. Mm. OK, so I think that's it for basic things about probabilities. Um, what we'll do now is counting. Okay, so we've seen several sample spaces where you might want to say that the probability of every outcome in the sample space is the same as every other outcome. For example, uh, the simplest one was the sample space with heads and tails. And uh, if you have a fair coin, then the probability of heads is a half, the probability of tails is a half. If you go to the more complicated sample space where you maybe toss the coin a hundred times, then any sequence of length a hundred of H's and T's would have the same probability as any other sequence. If I maybe confine myself to just um, Which outcome is more likely if you toss a fair coin seven times? They're the same. The same these would have the same probability or same likelihood of happening if you have a fair coin. And if I drew any other sequence of length seven of H's and T's, the probability of that sequence would be the same. If we're doing successes and failures and each uh, one has probably half of happening, then it would be the same. In drawing cards from a deck, if you draw five cards from a deck of 52, any hand of, uh, composed of five cards is as likely as any other hand uh, composed of five cards. So those would be two examples of sample, uh, of sample spaces where the probabilities you want to assign to events are all the same. And if you have that situation, Okay, from now on, whenever I want to write such that, I'm going to use the abbreviation ST. 
because we say it so much, and I don't like to write so much. That is, all outcomes have the same probability. And if we have an event A in such a sample space, then the probability of A would just be the number of elements of A over the number of elements in the sample space. Because what's the probability of each outcome if this happens? What would the probability of each outcome be? Well, let's enumerate the outcomes. Let's suppose we have a, can we have an infinite sample space with this pro uh, property? Could omega be infinite? Let's suppose it were. What about the events that are composed of just the single outcomes? <coughs> are these events disjoint for different i and j? I intersect AJ is empty. What about their union? Ooh, whatever it is here. Let's say this number up here is uh, N, where that could be infinity, possibly. I'm not ruling it out. So these are mutually disjoint. Their union is omega. So what's the probability of the union? There are two things we can say about the probability of the union. One is it's the probability of omega, which is 1. And the other is, these are mutually disjoint, so this would be the sum of all the individual outcomes, probably that omega i happened. I'll write it that way. Remember, a i is the, I probably should do this, but I won't after this. Okay. And how are the different sum ends here different? They're all the same. They all have the same value, right? How many of them are there? N. So this would be N times the probability of maybe the first one. So what's the probability of omega 1? Can I solve this using the extreme ends of this string of equalities? Probability of omega 1, probability of this individual outcome would be 1 over n, the number of elements in omega. n is the number of elements in omega. Okay. And this would be true if I put i there, too, because they all have the same probability. So if all outcomes have the same probability, we know two things. Uh, the sample space omega can't be infinite, 
Why not? If little n is infinite, what's 1 over little n? 0. And, and then the probability of omega would be 0. We can't have that. So if all outcomes are to have the same probability, we must be talking about a finite sample space. And then the probability of each outcome is 1 over the number of elements in the sample space. And now why would this be true? Why would this be true? What's, this is the number of elements in omega, right? How could we compute this probability? But the only thing we know so far is the probability of the union of disjoint events is the sum of the probabilities of those events. Now we could write out all the outcomes in omega. I'm sorry, in A. It would look something like this. Maybe it's omega 1 through omega k. These are different outcomes, different elements of the sample space. And I could re rewrite this as the union i equal 1 to k of the sets that contain the individual outcomes. Correct? And now what about these for different if omega i is different from omega j, the two sets here will be disjoint, right? So here's an expression of A as a disjoint union of events. And so what can we say about the probability of A? It's the sum of the probabilities of the individual outcomes in that event. Okay. And now these all have the same value. What's the value of each one of these? It's 1 over the, the size of omega, right? So this is 1 over the number of elements in omega. If we add up this that many times, we get k over the number of elements in omega. But what's k? k is the number of elements of a. So to compute probabilities in sample spaces where all the outcomes are equally likely, to compute the probability of an event, all you do is count the number of elements in that event, count the number of elements in the sample space, and take the ratio. So that's why we want to get some techniques for counting. Any question on this? Now this will allow us to compute say, probability of a full house, or two pair, or three of a kind in poker. And then you'll understand why the various hands uh, are ordered in the way they are. <laughs> OK, so all the, the counting uh, that we'll do comes from one simple uh, principle. Multiplication principle. Let me change this to an M here. I think you can do that in your notes without much of it going. So if there are 
m ways to do, perform one action, maybe you can say it that way, and n ways to perform a second action, then there are m times n ways to perform both actions. First I toss a coin, then I roll a die. So experiment one is tossing a coin, experiment two is rolling a die. How many possible outcomes are there in the first experiment? Two, how many in the second? Six, so how many altogether? Twelve. Okay, so uh, you probably have been in situations where you had to select three people from a class, maybe one to be the hall monitor, one to collect the homework, and the other one to be the bathroom monitor yeah, from grade school, right? So uh, there are three distinct jobs that have to be done. So I'm <laughs> going to select three individuals for this, and I don't know how many people are here, but I would guess there are uh, 47 people here. <laughs> I didn't count, <laughs> just <laughs> take that number out, okay. So um, here's job one, job two, job three. Uh, so I have some order here, like ex experiment one, or uh, <clears throat> the first thing I have to do is pick someone for hall monitor. That's when you are going, say kids are going out, to the out of the class. How many possible choices do I have for hall monitor? 47. 47, okay. Now, I don't want to pick the same person again. So I have to do, perform the second task. How many ways can I perform the second task? 46. And the third task, it'd be 45, okay? So that number is, well, you multiply them together and I don't know what it is. Okay, so this is a number of ways to select three people from a class of 47 and form an ordered sample. This is Okay, now the order is important here because I'm assigning different tasks to each person selected. What if I could assign the same task to I had two, two or more tasks to the same person? In other words, what if the same person could serve all three roles? Or maybe one person could do two of the jobs and a third one could do the third job. How many ways would there be to do that? So I still have 47 choices for the first one, but now I can choose that person again. So I still have 47 for the second, and I would still have 47 for the third. This is the number of ways to form or select. Maybe I'll use the word select an ordered sample.
with replacement. from a group of 47, or a set. Okay. So that's been ordering. What if we uh, drop the ordering for a moment? What if I just want a committee of size 5 from, a, from this class? Okay, so first of all, is this going to be um, with or without replacement? Without, because uh, I need five different people, right? Okay, so um, what if we did this kind of thing here? I have these five, and I just do, well, there are 47 ways to pick the first one, 46 to pick the second, 45 ways to pick the third, 44 to pick the fourth and 43 ways to pick the last one. Is that going to be this number? Overcounted. It's overcounted. By how much? Well, here are five were the individuals. I might have picked you, 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 you. But then I might have picked you, 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 or you, 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 right? So how many ways have I overcounted? I have the same set of five people, but I might have picked her first, second, third, fourth, fifth, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. How many ways have we overcounted here? Yeah, it's the number. Well, that's exactly right. And uh, in words, that's the number of ways to order five objects. Right? How many ways can you arrange five objects? Uh, first objects. Uh, sorry, not. Don't mean to talk about you like your objects. <laughs> How many ways to arrange five people? You could be the first person, second, third, fourth, fifth. Okay, or you could be first, second. Okay, so let's count. We have to divide by the number of ways of rearranging these people. How many ways are there to arrange five distinguishable people or objects? This is called, these are called permutations. So we're not done yet with that. How many permutations are there of the first n numbers? How many different ways can I arrange these numbers? Well, this uses the multiplication principle, maybe uh, an extension of it from 2 to n things. How many w choices are there for the first thing? n. And every time I make a choice of something for the first position, how many choices remain for the second position? n minus 1, and then times n minus 2 for the third position, n minus 3 for the fourth, etc. And I have two choices for the next last position. How many choices do I have for the last? Well, that's the last player picked, and has to go there. There's only one way to do that. And if I multiply all these numbers together, there's a nice name for that number. What is it? Yeah, and how, 
if you don't want to say factorial, you'll just say n with a lot of emphasis, because that's an exclamation mark. N. <laughs> okay. N factorial, let's go. Okay. All right, so let's go back to this problem. Uh, we've overcounted here. Uh, for every choice of the same five people, we've counted that how many times? Well, it's the number of ways we could order five people. How many ways can you order five people? Five factorial. So we should divide this number by five factorial. Okay, so let's make this a little more uh, general. Is that okay, everybody? Dividing by five factorial? Because every committee of those five people has appeared in this count five factorial times. Recognize that song. <laughs> How many ways are there to select a group of R, size R from a group or set of size N? Well, I make N our R slots here. All right, so there are R slots to fill. Or bins or boxes or uh, job assignments or whatever. How many ways can I choose the first object? How many ways are to choose the first object? N, right? And then to choose the second. This is without replacement because I want to get R dis well, I, yeah. Maybe I should say without replacement. I'm sorry, yeah, without replacement. n minus 2. Now this goes up to r here. If I'm counting this way, I have uh, 1, 2, 3, up to r, right? So how am I going to describe this last number here? Right, n minus r plus 1. Or you can think of that as being, well, yeah, n minus the quantity r minus 1, because I'm Think of this as, see, when I start counting here, one, two, three, notice this number it is one less than this one. This number is one less than this. Here's r. This number ha I'm subtracting has to be one less than r. What's one less than r? It's r minus one, okay? So I multiply these numbers together, but then what do I have to do if I'm, only interest, I'm, not, I'm not interested in the order? I'm just interested in having the, which elements are there, not what order they're in? Every permutation gives the same group. I can get a particular group and get a permutation that would give me the same group. How many times have I overcounted when I do this? I have to R factorial times, right? So I have to divide this number by R factorial. Okay. Now, Something you can do here, um, this uh, looks like a frustrated n factorial. Frustrated y. Well, it doesn't get all the way down to 1. It stops. What if I put, what if I made it happy and made it n factorial? I still want this to be equal. I have this r factorial here. I threw in some things. What did I throw in? Yeah, the product of the numbers that start just below this. What starts just below this one? n minus r, and then I put in n minus r minus 1 all the way down to 1. So down here I should divide by n minus r 
factorial. Okay, so the number of ways to select R objects without replacement from group of N objects is this here. And this is a number you can compute, maybe with, by hand or with a calculator if it gets to be a little bit large. There are uh, approximations for this for big N that we can, we'll see later. But this will help us, um, for example, do the following computation. What's the probability of a full house in poker? Poker hand consists of five cards. This probability is the number of uh, five card hands. And up here we'd have the number of ways to get a full house. Because this is a problem in a sample space where all outcomes are equally likely. Any five card hand is as likely as any other five card hand. So to compute the probabilities, we just need to compute the size of the sample space and the size of our event and take the ratio. Okay, so let's try the denominator first. How many ways can you get a five card hand from a deck of 52? Is there anything on the board that helps you do this? This, where R is five and N is 52. By the way, there's another um, way to write this. You put a parenthesis that's big enough, tall enough for a column vector, and you put NR there. I think there's another one, C of NR, maybe you've seen. Okay, but I'll do this one. Okay. Sometimes this is in words we say n choose r. Okay, n choose r. So the denominator here we know is 52 choose 5. That's a pretty big number. What about the numerator? What's a full house? Again, it's uh, three of one numerical value and two of another numerical value. Okay? So we have two tasks, or uh, two tasks to perform. We, first, we have to pick the uh, numerical value for the three of a kind, and then we have to, well, first we have to pick the three of the kind, and then we have to pick the two of a kind. Okay, so these are kind of ordered objects, right? Triplet and a pair. We can distinguish a triplet from a pair, right? So how many ways are there to get three of the same kind of card. How many ways are there to get a triplet from a deck of 52? Okay, there are 13 different values, like ace, king, queen, right? But now, so first we select the value. because you can pick it. Ace, king, queen, jack, 10, down to 2. There are 13 different values. Now, once you've done that, what do you have to do next? Suppose you, suppose you, your three of a kind is twos. How many ways are you to get three twos from a deck of 52? Well, how many twos are in the deck? And from those, you have to pick three of them, right? How many ways are you to pick From four things, you have to pick 
three things. Four choose three. Now this number is easy to compute. Uh, if you're picking three things, that means one way to do that is pick one to leave out. So from four things, how, how many ways are there to pick one? Think of ice cream, vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, raspberry. How many ways are, are there to pick just one of those? Four, right? Okay. And if you use this formula down here, you'd get the same result. Okay, now, so the number of ways to get three of a kind would be the product of these things, 13 times 4, right? First you perform the task here, and then you perform the task here. The way, number of ways to perform, to get both tasks accomplished is 13 times 4. That's the multiplication principle. Okay, M times P, MP, multiplication principle. Okay, now let's get the value for the, let's get the pair, okay? How do you get the pair? You have to perform two operations. First pick the value for the pair, and then pick the particular cards with that value, okay? So now, next we get the number of ways, you have to do the number of ways to select value for the pair. What would that be? 12. Why? Well, we already did the first experiment, which took that value out of consideration. Why? Because we have how many cards left of that value? One, and we need two. So we, we can't use that anymore. So here we have 12. And given that, how many ways are there to pick two cards of that given value? Okay, so each value, for each value there are four cards of that value. How many ways are there to pick two cards from four? It's four, choose two. And what would that be? Here we'd have, maybe we could do it this way. What would this number be? Four. Here we'd have two. What would this be? Four minus two plus one is what? Four minus two is two plus one is three. So actually we start with four and end up with three. That means it's four times three over two or Six. Okay. So the number of ways to get the two of a kind then would be or to get the pair would be twelve times six. And again that's the multiplication principle. First we pick the value, then given the value we pick the two cards with that value. Now how many ways can we get a full house? First we pick the three of a kind, then we pick the two of a kind. How do you get the total number of ways? We just multiply the numbers together. So we'd multiply, I'll, I'll do it this way, 13 times 12 times uh, four times, six times four. And that's the probability of a full house. Let's do one more. Let's uh, do the probability of a, uh, which one is a straight or a full house? Yeah, a straight or a full house? Hmm? Full house, okay. Uh, let's do a flush. Let's do probably a flush. I think it's a little simpler to compute. That means all the cards are of the same suit. Okay. Oops. You didn't see that, did you? 
OK, so how many ways are they going to flush? Well, what's the first task you have to do? You have to pick a suit, like spades, or hearts, or diamonds, or clubs. How many suits are there? Four. Now once you've picked the suit, you have to pick five cards from that suit. How many cards are in each suit? Thirteen. How many ways are they to pick five from thirteen? Thirteen, choose five. That's a three. Okay, so which wins? Full house or a flush? Well, all you have to do here is compare the numerator. numerator. What's the numerator here? We get four times 13, choose five. That'd be 13 times 12 times 11 down to six over uh, uh, I'll do five down to one here. Then I got five factorial here and a eight factorial, right? N choose R. It's uh, 13 factorial over 13 minus five and five. Okay, so now I can rewrite this as four times 13 times 12 times 11 times 10 times nine over five factorial. What happened here? I canceled this eight factorial with the product of 1 up to 8. Okay. Now what? Um, well, this 5 factorial has a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Right? Maybe the 5 times the 2 can cancel the 10. That leaves what? 4 times 3. And the 4 times 3 can cancel the 12. So we get 13 times 11 times 9 times 4 here. That's what this numerator becomes. What about that numerator over there? So which is bigger? Well, there's a 4 on both sides. So let me put both numbers on the same board here. OK, which is bigger? Well, the 4s cancel. The 13s cancel. This is 99, that's 72. So the probability of a full house is less than the probability of a flush, and so a full house beats a flush. Okay, all right, that's it for today. So I hope this convinces you that probability is useful. <laughs>